Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the BS and Beer Show. Uh, BS stands for Building Science, of course. Our topic tonight is making concrete more sustainable or sustainably, depending on how you want to uh, phrase that. Um, my name is Mike. Uh, I'm a designer in Maine. And tonight I am drinking a mocktail, which is a, uh, I have a ginger beer, blood orange soda, and my wife is an herbalist. So I also have some shisandra berry and elderberry tinctures in there. So a good, uh, immune, tasty immune booster. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, thank all of our guests for coming tonight uh, from all over the, well, all over North America, uh, not just Amer not just the United States, and also thank all the, all the audience for joining in. Um, uh, just a quick note about BS and Beer. Uh, th this is a, a show that will be recorded and saved. Uh, we also really encourage local groups. Uh, BS and Beer started as just a lo local building science discussion groups, and we have a bunch now spread all over. There's no uh, no copyright or anything, so feel free to take the name and start your own. You can uh, get in touch with us if you want some tips. It's a really great way to build your local network and share uh, ideas that are more appropriate for your local area. Uh, I'd also like to thank Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building Magazine for being our media partners. Um, and uh, yeah, video of tonight's conversation will be available at Green Building Advisor and also on our website, which is the bsandbeershow.com. Um, I'd like to introduce my co-host tonight, uh, Emily, Travis, and Brian. And I will turn it over to Brian. All right, thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Pontalillo, I'm editor at Green Building Advisor. I've uh, been at Fine Home Building for a long time. And I just have a little bit of housekeeping uh, to take care of before we get started um, and get into uh, what, what I imagine is going to be a very interesting discussion tonight. Um, to start with, I am drinking uh, ginger turmeric tea. Uh, this evening, and I, I did realize today when I was getting this drink ready that it's a good thing that I didn't name this program. I've yet to have a beer on the Building Science and Beer Show. It wouldn't have been nearly as catchy if I had catchy of a title, or probably interesting to some people who, who join us um, if I had named it. So, first, first uh, order of housekeeping is is about the chat box. So we're going to take questions in a little while, and the way we'll take questions is through the through the chat box. If you don't see the chat box yet, you can scroll your mouse down to the bottom of um, the video screen and you'll find some pop-ups and one of them will say chat and you can arrange the chat box anywhere you'd like on your screen. Uh, in Right before, right above the uh, dialog box where you'll type, there's a drop-down menu and it's important that um, you select all panelists and attendees there if you want everyone to see your questions, um, if you want us to see your questions. Um, if you want to speak with someone privately, you can select uh, their name. So that's an option. Um, you also might have noticed a poll tonight. If, if you didn't see the poll, there's also a, uh, a poll button in that, in that pop-up at the bottom of your screen. And if you'd, if you'd uh, like to help us get an idea of how we're doing with the sort of level of information with these, uh, with these discussions, we'd love to have you just take that poll. It's, it's one question, not too, um, not too scientific of a poll. Um, and then finally, the, the, there's a few options for um, how you view the, the show tonight. And we've heard feedback from people, some people um, like one view versus another. And so we just wanted to point out that you have the option up in the top right hand corner of your screen to choose either speaker view or, or um, gallery view. So you can either see um, on your screen the person who is speaking at the time full screen, or you can just see everyone for the length of the length of the show. We want to make sure you all knew that 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 was an option. So the uh, the agenda for tonight, um, just like just like every every week now, um, we're going to start off with presentations from our uh, three panelists. Um, we'll go a few minutes with each of them. After the presentation, we'll take questions from uh, both the hosts and from um, you all who are participating. Again, using the the chat box for that. And then um, as we get towards seven o'clock, after we get through the first hour of the show, we'll start to let things just kind of roll in a free form way and just see how the last half hour goes. And keep in mind that this is recorded. It, it's on um, tomorrow or by Saturday anyway, it will be available both on the uh, BS and Beer YouTube channel and also greenbuildingadvisor.com. So if you have to bail out, um, but you're finding the discussion interesting, you can always catch up with what you missed. Uh, tomorrow or, or at any point. And with that, um, Emily. 
All right. Hi, guys. Emily Matram. I am having a bale of hay session IPA, and there's a, there's a nice little round pig on this side, which is about how I feel about quarantine. Uh, we've been baking a lot of sourdough bread over here. Uh, we've had requests to find out how these carpenters and the sourdough bread thing has become a, a thing with all of us in, in quarantine. Um, but I have the privilege tonight to introduce our guests, so pretty exciting lineup tonight. Uh, we we have Bruce King. Um, Bruce is the author of The New Carbon Architecture. Uh, he's been practicing structural, engineer for 40, structural engineering for 40 years. He's written a few books and is also the founder and director of the Ecological Building Network, a nonprofit information resource that sponsors the Build Well Source, which is an online library of low carbon and carbon storing materials. So all of you who have asked us about that, that's going to be a great resource. Bruce, if you can pop the link to that in the chat box at some point tonight that would be awesome we also have trevor acorn trevor is a principal and project manager at the walter at walter p moore with 15 years of experience in structural engineering and um, Trevor's passion is to design structures that are efficient, beautiful, and constructible. He works closely with architects, builders, and owners to find responsible solutions that work. So welcome, Trevor. And Christy Gamble is a Senior Director of Sustainability for Carbon Cure Technologies. Christy uh, drives the Carbon Cure's mission to reduce 500 megatons of annual carbon emissions from the concrete industry. In her role, Christy collaborates closely with designers and builders who seek to reduce the carbon impact of building and infrastructure projects. So very exciting lineup tonight to talk about what we can do to either produce more sustainable concrete or use concrete more sustainably. So uh, very exciting. We'll kick it uh, back to Mike tonight. Um, nope, sorry, Travis. Can't read the schedule. Back That's all right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Travis Brungart. I, uh, I run the Kansas City BS and Beer with my friends Joe and Joe and my business partner at Catalyst Construction uh, as well. So tonight I am ecstatic about drinking this local BKS Artisan Ales Vacation Island Sour, which I know Emily would not enjoy, but I'm enjoying it real nice. Thanks. Um, I have only been building for like 15 or 20 years and the uh, most uh, instruction I got on concrete came from a production builder. The guy that trained me on concrete told me, uh, Travis, you know, he hiked his pants up and kind of pushed me around the job site and said, Travis, these finishers out here, you got to keep an eye on them because water in concrete is strength, but water on concrete is weakness. And I never forgot it. Uh, and I decided to apply it to my toast tonight that beer in your belly is pleasure, but beer on your belly is sorrow. Raise a glass. That's unbelievable, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> and it may not even be true, but that's what I was taught. And I put it all in Paul Gibson. So find him and tell, tell him he's misinforming his, uh, his trainees. Um, with that, I wanted to go back to our guests. And uh, I think I'd like to kind of just start with you, Bruce, if you don't mind. If you could just real briefly uh, tell us anything else uh, about yourself that we missed in our introductions of you anything else that's going on that we shouldn't miss. And then I was going to have you kick it off with a, a, a kind of an introductory question uh, because a lot of people bounce around the words cement and concrete interchangeably, and that's not accurate. And so most people here probably know about that, but maybe bring the, the layman like myself up to speed. And if you want, throw in a definition for puzzle in too, because I learned that one from Mike, and that's another good word that I like to uh, educate people on. So please introduce yourself, my friend. Sure. Um, well, can you hear me all right? Uh, yeah, yeah. My, my, my microphone apparently comes and goes on my laptop, so somebody shout if... Um, well, first of all, I want to set your foreman straight that he had it 180 degrees wrong. The more water in your concrete, the weaker it's going to be. And water on top of it will help it cure properly. So as a general rule, he was pretty much 180 degrees wrong. As to uh, the difference between cement and concrete, I'll cover that in my first slide. Great. And I, I have to say that uh, I was uh, startled and delighted to see that there's such a thing as BS in beer, that building science is um, something that people know about and talk about. I first met John Straub uh, 
22 years, 23 years ago. Um, he's been a guest in my home many times. My kids grew up with Dr. Strawberry. Because he and I shared an interest in uh, straw bale construction, which I did a lot of work in and wrote books, and John wrote a lot. And, um, and he's, of course, a delightful guy. If none of you have ever met or seen John, if you ever get a chance to hear him speak, go, because he's one of the most smartest human beings I ever met and also one of the nicest human beings I ever met. So there's a little sidebar thing. So shall we get into concrete then? Shall I start whacking him over the head with the concrete wrap? Before you start your presentation, can I, uh, can I go ahead and uh, we'll move around and, and we'll cover, uh, I want to introduce Christy as well and give her a chance sure. to kind of add to her introduction. And uh, of course, I forgot to ask you, Bruce, what you're drinking. And then uh, the same for Christy. What are you drinking tonight? At three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm drinking water. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> In an hour, in two uh, hours, I'll be on another Zoom call. In two hours, I'll be on another Zoom call drinking a vodka martini. Just so you, nobody worries that I'm too anything. But no teetotalers here, huh? No. Well, let me uh, let me get back to you, Christy. Uh, just an opportunity to kind of add to what we we said in introducing you. Um, Emily kind of kicked us off, but if you have anything that you want to add to that, something that we should know about you, uh, and of course, what are you drinking as well? And then I think you might have a, a special bit of knowledge to share with us as far as kind of defining what carbon emissions are. I think you'll probably get into that more in your presentation, but uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Well, thanks. Um, so my name is Christy Gamble. I'm the Senior Director of Sustainability with Carbon Cure. I am situated in Saskatchewan. Uh, I saw in the comments, it looks like a couple people are really excited about that. Who knew? Uh, so Saskatchewan, where I am in Regina, is about two hours north of the Montana-North Dakota border. It's normally super cold. Thankfully, today we're at about 65 degrees, so, you know, not the great white north right now. Um, I am a very Canadian Canadian. Uh, I'm a competitive curler, so that's my interesting thing to learn. If you've ever tried curling, I, I do it every day. And uh, I am drinking a local beer. One of the nice things about Saskatchewan, there aren't a whole lot of them, but we do have good beer because we have good wheat. And so this is a uh, Martzen. It is a Regina District Brewery. It is uh, the, the German word for March, and it's the beer that is made in March that then has to get dumped in October, which is why they have Oktoberfest. So there you go. And what is carbon emissions? Well, carbon emissions are basically waste carbon dioxide, so CO2, uh, a very common molecule in our atmosphere, that is anthropogenically um, created through industrial processes, whether it's through transportation, through uh, cement manufacturing, as we're going to find out, energy generation. And that CO2 can enter the atmosphere and at uh, certain rates of um, CO2 in the atmosphere, we see a decline in ozone that um, is causing climate change. And so that's why we're collectively working on ways to reduce our uh, carbon emissions. Excellent. That's very succinct. Thank you. Um, uh, our last guest is uh, my good friend Trevor, who is a regular at our Kansas City BS and Beer. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you, my friend. Uh, but do feel free to add to the other introductions for you. And then also, uh, one of the, my favorite things about Trevor is that he will frequently um, give me little historical lessons uh, through his Instagram feed, uh, at Trevor Acorn. Uh, on structural engineers. So I'm gonna ask you, who invented concrete, Trevor? And then obviously oh, introduce man. yourself and once again, your local beer. So the problem there, Travis, is I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I do have it. I uh, actually read it in an article I was reading uh, a couple days ago, but maybe someone else, maybe, maybe Bruce or Christy could jump in and, and, and fill us with that knowledge, but I don't know who invented concrete, which is sad. Which is sad. Um, Mike put on the agenda that it was the Romans. So I would have, I would have taken <laughs> any Rome. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. So, um, right. I mean, the Romans were the first to use like kind of modern day concrete, but it was sort of like rediscovered, right. In like the 1800s and, uh, whoever invented the, the Portland cement, I thought your question was really about Portland cement and modern oh. concrete. Um, and I don't remember that guy's name, but it was, I think, mid 1800s early 1800s so. joseph asplund patented it in 1819 201 years ago sounds like google thanks Bruce. over the world it was a, it was a disruptive <laughs> technology that took over the concrete that was already there based on lime and he figured out yeah, to cook lime. the limestone potter and intermix clay and he came up with something that was just so idiot proof and strong 
and it was basically a, a new form of hydraulic lime of the sorts that had been around for millennia. But um, this was this took over the world. This this was the Google of construction. It was it still is. It's an incredibly cool building product. The only problem it is, is it super cool. creates a lot of emissions. Um, yeah, thanks, Bruce. So I'm drinking a uh, Casey Beer Company uh, Lager, uh, Hell's Lager, Munich style golden lager. Uh, what I love about these guys is um, this guy had a passion for beer uh, and uh, a memory of it being the best in Germany when he had traveled there. So he came to Kansas City and he imports much of the ingredients from Germany and then tries to recreate as authentically as possible um, for us. And it tastes great. So cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Well, let's jump into presentations. Bruce, do you want to kick things off with your, uh, with your slideshow? Sure. Are you seeing that concrete? Yes. There, is, there, there may be, um, you might want to go to, yeah, there you go. You got it. Perfect. Yeah. You seen it now? You seeing a picture of the Pantheon? Yes. Okay, good. This ties it all together. Yeah, the Romans made uh, the oldest form of what we now think of as concrete. Uh, they did it without any Portland cement, which is why I show this, the most iconic concrete building in the world. Um, not without any emissions, but uh, without Portland cement. And um, interesting to note, the Pantheon is 2,000 years old now, one of the most, you know, the most impressive building I have ever been in. And um, if you were to ask a modern engineering firm to design a Pantheon, they would give you something that would not last for 2,000 years. Interesting to note. Um, so we still have a lot to learn about this thing called concrete. And to sort of go back to the invention thing, concrete is just artificial rock. That's all it is, sand and gravel and glue. And you mix them all up and then you spray them into place or you pour them into place or you pack them into place. And that's how you get not just a building or a foundation or a bridge, but an asphalt highway or a piece of sheetrock or an adobe brick uh, are all forms of concrete. What we're accustomed to now is, is thinking of Portland cement concrete. That's what the industry is. That's what everybody thinks of as concrete. Um, and my assertion is that we start to need to develop, it's not a divorce and a separation, Portland cement and concrete, because they don't necessarily go hand in hand. So how do you make low carbon concrete? How do I advance my slides? I'm seeing my face and uh, the other, some other faces on the side of my screen. Are you guys also seeing that? We're only seeing your slides, Bruce. Okay, good, good. So um, it's not exact. It's not a single pathway formula to make low carbon concrete. It's a combination of different things, and um, which one works best for you depends on your economics, where you are geographically, what's available to you. It's generally going to be usually start with replacing the cement with something a little less uh, emission-y, which is basically supplementary cementitious, cementitious materials, SCMs. Most common in North America are uh, fly ash, the byproduct of coal-fired power, and slag, the byproduct of making steel. Uh, coal-fired power is, is, is waning. It's going away, thankfully. And... Um, Steel making uh, provides the slag, but most of what we get on the West Coast is uh, from China. It comes over on a barge. It depends on where you are and what's going to be most available. But they're both really, really great supplements or even replacements for Portland cement to make high-quality concrete. More about that in a moment. This is a real big one and one that I try to communicate to engineers. The whole, engi the whole industry, and especially structural engineers, are accustomed to specifying concrete in terms of its benchmark 28-day compressive strength, FC prime, at 28 days. Because 100 years ago, we started making reinforced concrete buildings, and we noticed that it got most of its strength in a month. And so that became the benchmark. It's nothing sacred about it. It's just what was typical. People think it's sacred, and they're habituated to it. 
if you give concrete even just another month to come up to strength, then you can lower the carbon footprint often 20 or 30 percent with the smaller amount of cement you need because cement is where all the emissions are. So often the simplest way to reduce the carbon footprint of a job or of your concrete is to give it more time to come to strength. Much of concrete doesn't need to have strength for months or even a year. The foundation you pour for most buildings won't have any weight on it for a while. Some concrete needs to have strength right away, um, but mostly it doesn't. So depends on what you're doing. Give it time if you can, and that's the easiest way to lower emissions, and it's cheaper. Cement's the most high carbon, most expensive part of the concrete. I guess I should have added, in case anybody isn't already clear about that, cement and concrete, I asked about that. Cement is the glue that you put with sand and gravel to make concrete. Portland cement is where all the emissions are because you bake limestone at 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit and mix it with some clay, grind it up, and that's basically how you make Portland cement. A ton of carbon emissions for every ton of cement made, half of them from the fuel that you use to heat the limestone and half of it from the chemical process. You change calcium carbonate limestone into calcium oxide and then CO2 that goes up in the air. So reducing the cement in whatever way you can is um, generally your strategy for lowering the carbon of your concrete. Here's another one. Blended cements, as they're becoming more and more common around the country, around the world. Blended meaning you make some Portland cement and then you mix it with ground limestone, finely ground limestone, finely ground and partly heated clay. Um, there's a number of different forms of blended cements. They're all well recognized. This is nothing outside hippie radical stuff. It's all ASTM certified stuff. The biggest impediment right now to them uh, entering the marketplace more is that um, the highway departments are conservative about it and have to do five-year tests on all sorts of things to be confident that they can let them be used. And if the highway department will use it, the, the local ready-mix supplier may not want to even bother with it because he's got to be ready to do a highway job if he needs to. You can inject carbon into the concrete. Blue Planet is this kind of exciting company here in the Bay Area that uh, is making aggregate, making gravel out of emissions. Basically, you capture the carbon emissions out of a cement plant or a power plant and roll a grain of sand around in it like an oyster making a pearl and you make artificial limestone aggregate. They are working on building their first plant right now so it's not commercially available. They've done some pilot projects at the San Francisco airport and it's worked out great. You can also augment the strength by injecting liquid carbon dioxide into the concrete. Christy's going to tell you a whole bunch more about this in a little bit because carbon cure is out there and available to all of you right now. Um, very cool thing. And by doing that, you don't need as much cement, so it lowers the footprint. Uh, using reclaimed aggregate seems like an obvious thing. Why not just grind it up and use it as, as the aggregate for a new batch of concrete? It's not as simple as that. Um, there's a number of things that get in the way. I've got books that are two inches thick on how to use reclaimed concrete as aggregate, and it gets that complicated. There's been that much research. Um, so it's not that easy. This picture is from Haiti, where I was after the earthquake there. They had, the streets were filled with concrete rubble, and it was lousy concrete. That's why those buildings collapsed. That's a whole story in itself. But using reclaimed concrete is an ongoing issue in the industry. I and mean, typically we use it for a lower grade purpose, like highway uh, backfill or roadways, which is kind of a waste, really. So we're lo always looking at ways trying to find ways to make better use of reclaimed concrete. There's also return concrete that every ready mix plant deals with all the time because they send out five yards to your job site, but they only, you only needed four and a half. So now they got a half a yard they have to do something with. And they all have their own ways of dealing with that. But all too often it ends up just being washed into a waterway or onto a pavement or something like that. And again, it's a, basically you generate a whole bunch of emissions and don't um, get any return for it. It's just wasted. But this is the big one uh, to me, and I'm speaking as a structural engineer, is that in my industry, we're very habituated to that 28-day strength and to not being very flexible about how we do things. But um, our governing institution, the American Concrete Institute themselves came out and sent a memo to all engineers a couple of years ago. Hello, engineers. 
let go of the steering wheel, let the concrete supplier design the concrete mix. Don't you tell him minimum cement content or water ratios or anything else. Let him do that. You think you need to control it, but you're oftentimes making the job worse or more expensive than it needs to be. And engineers aren't used to doing that. We're, I was raised to um, you know, throw an extra bag of cement in there, specify a strength higher than what you really need. And so routinely, I, every job I've done, and I've worked on high-rise buildings and hospitals and houses, everything, every job I've done had way more cement, way more emissions in it for its concrete than was necessary. There's reasons for that. You want to be conservative. You want a factor of safety, yes, but we're way overboard in our industry. And it, it, as a whole, the whole North American concrete industry could reduce its carbon footprint by 20 or 30 percent tomorrow without really even noticing if we just bothered to try. Communication. Who knew? Communication can lead to wonderful things. The building you're seeing on the right is the California Public Utilities Commission building in San Francisco. And Dave Marr, this wonderful and inventive structural engineer, designed it. And uh, they were under pressure to, I forget what drove this, but, but Dave said, I want to just talk to everybody. And he managed to get the concrete supplier and the general contractor, and I think a few other stakeholders in a room together, and they all talked about it, and when do we need to get strength, and what's our schedule going to be, and we can't mess with the schedule. And eventually, when they all talked it out and thought things through and worked it all out, they could reduce the carbon footprint of the concrete by, it was a large number, I forget now, probably 20 30%, maybe 40%. But also, they ended up getting a whole other floor in the building because they reduced the floor-to-floor -floor height. Everybody was happy about that, just because they had bothered to communicate. Out here, we've, uh, we've written a building code. Uh, I sat down with my building official and said, how about we just try to adjust embodied emissions through the building code? And he said, great, I don't know how to make it happen. Well, a whole bunch of stars aligned, and next thing we knew, we had a grant, and all the relative stakeholders were there, and we wrote and passed a uh, building code limiting the emissions of concrete poured in my county. I show this picture of the uh, San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge finished a few years ago because it's a sort of a poster child that, because um, they used the Caltrans, California Environment Transportation used low carbon concrete for this bridge. Not so much for the climate, though they were aware of that and happy about it, but because it's better concrete, it was less permeable to saltwater intrusion, so it protected the rebar of it. If you're interested, just remember marincounty.org, and you can go search for the concrete code and the code language and the research and all sorts of uh, sample specifications are all there, uh, free for the taking. Residential specs, commercial specs, it was great. Very happy project. Uh, I think that's my last one. There's the book you were talking about. Uh, not for me to say, but some people are saying it's the best book they've ever read. So um, give it a shot. You can learn more broadly about embodied emissions in the built environment. Concrete is the, is the big one, the easy big target, but there's lots of other places where we can figure out how to not only reduce emissions, but turn buildings into carbon absorbing sponges. And with that, I hope I haven't gone over time. That was I yield the floor. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bruce. That was great. And just as a, as a te teaser, next week we'll be talking with uh, uh, Chris Magwood, Jacob Rekusen, and oh, good, good, uh, and um, uh, D David Arkin about about uh, car carbon storing bu buildings. So it'll it'll sort of b build on tonight's show in a more 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 general way. Um, yeah, no, that that was great. Um, sh should we move hey, right on, um, Mike? It, it's okay. Uh, there you go. If it's, a, if it's okay, I'd like to interject a question um, because there was, and I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna no see if I can get Doug in here to ask the question um, because there was a, in the chat box, there was a dialogue going on about the 28 um, day strength requirements written into the code. Um, not sure if I'm, if, uh, if Doug is, if I'm getting him up here, but, um, and, and where that came from and, and how that should be interpreted. Um, and, and Bruce was Bruce was talking about the codes a little bit, so I thought maybe now he could he could address that before we moved on. Oh, here comes Doug. <laughs> hey, hey Doug. Doug. 
Uh, Bruce, it sounds like you, you put out a lot more information uh, after when I posted that question, which I, I can't wait to look into that Marin County one. But um, my question is, is the 28-day strength rule obviously is a proxy for ultimate strength as used in, say, the residential code requirements for, uh, for 28-day strength. So it is, if you were to just reduce the amount of cement in the concrete, the ultimate strength would also drop, if I'm not mistaken. And then my question is, were those, are those residential code numbers from practice or from some calculated necessity at one month in? And I would have guessed, did that make any sense? I'm not sure what you're asking me. Uh, I don't think the 28-day strength number is sanctified by code. It only says the engineer must specify the minimum compressive strength. And we're all very habituated to saying at 28 days. Fair enough. That's what every Bruce, engineer think, like said. I'll look into the... I think you're right there, Bruce. Sorry. I think you're right there about, there about, the, the, about uh, yeah. at least all commercial construction. Are we talking over each other a bit? Um, on as far as the international yeah, residential code, uh, it is yeah. Thanks. In the international residential code, it is codified twenty eight days. Um, is it? You know, most of the stuff, Bruce. Yeah, most of the stuff you and I would do is commercial, and and there we get to dictate at what strength the requirement is. So if you're gonna say it's fifty six days um, on a residential project, the local jurisdiction might flag it, and you might need to talk to them. Although I don't think what I what I would also say though is that um, the like the minimum concrete strength in the IRC is like 2500 or it depends on what its use is. That is the ultimate strength. It has nothing to do with 28 days, 56 days, anything else. It's uh, the sizes shown in the IRC are based on that ultimate strength which is noted at 25 days. Yeah. yeah. Am I yeah, right? The 2,500 <laughs> PSI is a, is a number in the code. A minimum strength 2,500 PSI to do just about anything. I don't right. know the origins of that either. I've been asking everybody in the industry, um, and I don't I don't know the origins of that. The, the, the compressive strength is a placeholder. It's or, or a, an indicator that tells you all sorts of things. Shear strength, durability. It implies all the other things that you need to know about because you, you, won't, you, know, you know, nobody needs 2,500 PSI or 5,000 PSI. It's, it's extraordinary, but it gets a little complicated. It always gets complicated, but I, like I, wasn't, to tell people aware, that. I, I wasn't aware that the IRC was saying 28 days. I, I guess I should read the code sometime. Um, I like to tell people that we're, we're specifying concrete in terms of pounds per square inch but our bearing capacity on the soil is in pounds yeah. per square foot. Yeah. If, you, if you compare the two, our concrete is very, very, very stiff and strong compared to what we're bearing on it. It doesn't need but, to be near as strong as, as that's actually for many applications. If I can interject that. Thank you for answering that. That was a great answer. Um, I really appreciate it. There's obviously a lot more information out there. I will say uh, two things about it. First of all, if you want to look this up, it's table R402.2 in the foundations chapter. And the second thing is that they have changed in, in the recent editions of the code in areas with uh, severe weathering, the compressive strength at 28 days has gone up, which tells me that they're trying to adapt to some field condition that has been seen in the real world. So I guess it is a very complicated picture and I just, you know, I'd love to hear more about uh, yeah. how we can get around these code requirements and still build good buildings. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in my presentation. Great. So. Yeah. Uh, thanks, yeah, Doug. The, the broader answer is that we've got these sclerotic codes that are ratcheting ever more conservative um, and adding cost to projects without adding a whole lot of uh, reduced risk. Um, that's a whole subject in itself. But the, it, we're ripe for a reinvention of building regulation. But boy, yeah. I'm not going to try to unpack that one here. I think what they're trying to do is decrease the permeability of the concrete and uh, strength is a proxy for that, um, sure. which I'll, yeah. uh, I'll talk about. Yeah, well, that's, the, that's a good se segue. Let's, let's, let's go, go into, into your, your, your presentation, Trevor. Okay. Um, okay, uh, do you guys see Walter P. Moore concrete in low carbon buildings? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Okay, let's click on the right screen. 
Uh, I'm going to skip through. I have some stuff on material here that uh, Bruce has already covered. So I'm going to skip through my first handful of slides pretty quickly. But um, we know when we make cement, it releases CO2. Um, well, we, we create CO2 from the heat, and it also releases it in the chemical reaction. Chris is going to talk about that some more. Um, in some of the circles <laughs> in which I uh, travel, um, concrete is, is demonized in a lot of ways. And um, I think that if you look at it in the big picture relative to other materials, it actually performs pretty well as far as uh, low carbon. The problem is there's a lot of it in our buildings. If you think about it, in our houses, in our steel, our steel buildings have concrete floors. Even a timber building probably has a concrete floor. There's a lot of concrete in all the buildings that we do. We use so much of it, it ends up being a huge contributor to overall CO2 emissions. Um, Bruce covered this, but there's a handful of things you can do to try to minimize your cement. Um, you can use larger aggregates. You can use more cement replacement. Um, you can test strength at 56 days or 84 days. Um, you can uh, use a lot of different admixtures. You could use a water reducer, say, to get the workability that you need without adding water and cement. Uh, you can use carbon cure, right? A whole bunch of different things that you can do um, on a project. And on larger commercial projects, we do specify these, these sort of things. On residential, um, not typically. So depends on the project. Um, quick little background, though. Historically, we have specified concrete as a proportioned mix, something like what you see here, like a one, three, three mix, where people would just always mix it the same way, right? One part cement, three parts stone, three parts sand. And um, you'll even see in like old drawings from a hundred years ago that this is how it's noted on the drawings, um, one, three, three, or something similar like to this. And it, it ends up, resulting in a certain strength typically, but it leaves no leeway for using fly ash or slag or any other um, approach, larger aggregates, right? That might increase strength, uh, lower cost, and lower cement. So what we try to do is do a performance specified mix where we just tell the ready mix supplier what strength we, ne we need and any other performance requirements, and we let him run with it. That's our goal. Um, yeah, and then, you know, as a structural engineer, there's a couple different things we can do. We can kind of right size our members and we can design members for the actual loads. Um, but what I like to tell other structural engineers is that um, strength is essential. This is a famous quote strength is essential, but otherwise unimportant. Like, once you meet the strength requirements of your job, whatever it is, having extra strength probably doesn't help you. Um, what you should really be concerned about. Um, is the durability and the serviceability and your environmental um, concerns. So that's kind of where I wanted to head into the next few slides, which I think is maybe less well-known, but very, very important. So ACI has got a great document, uh, 201, on a guide to, to durable concrete. And here's a list of six things that commonly impact um, the durability of your concrete. Uh, you know, finishing and curing mistakes are a big one. They're probably a bigger issue in, in residential construction. Um, but after you get pa after you know how to place concrete correctly, if you don't have the right mix, you could suffer from freezing and thawing damage, alkali, silica reaction or aggregate reaction, sulfate attack, chemical attack, or, or corrosion if you don't have enough cover. Um, all these things are going to, you know, you maybe, maybe you have a project that's low cement, um, and meets all your performance goals in a, in a lot of ways, but it doesn't have air content, the proper amount of in, in air in the concrete. And it's going to break apart due to freezing and thaw, and you're going to be demolishing that and rebuilding it, right? So we need to build durable <laughs> concrete um, to save on cement as well. And the, the biggest takeaway I think you should have for how do we how do we make durable concrete is to decrease the permeability of the concrete. What happens um, in concrete when you add water to the cement? Uh, the cement hydrates 
any excess water ends up finding a way out of that concrete as it dries. And it creates the little paths that you see on the right, those little veins through the concrete. Um, that, cre it, that creates a pathway for water, chemicals, everything, anything that might want to try to get through that concrete air. Um, it creates a pathway for that and creates long-term durability issues in your concrete. So um, thinking about how we can have a low permeable concrete is going to give you a higher, more highly durable concrete. So uh, a lot of different strategies for that, but we try to use a well-graded mix. Um, so we have good packing of, of the whole, of all the rock and sand in that concrete. We try to use low water cement ratio so that after the, after the cement hydrates, um, there's not much water left to create these paths. And another one I think which is pertinent to our conversation here is we can use slag and fly ash, these supplemental um, cementitious materials. They actually hydrate at a slower pace and um, will tend to fill up these gaps that the water creates, um, these holes, and create a more um, a, a lower permeable concrete. So this can be a huge thing, actually, uh, to uh, to increase in the overall longevity of the concrete that you pour. You can also do crystalline waterproofing, or uh, we use a lot of moisture vapor reducing ad admixtures, which is basically it's basically like a Jello mix you put into the concrete, and it uh, traps all the free water, keeps it from coming out. I could, if you guys have questions about any of that, I can talk to you more at length. But here is an example of the. Um, minimum concrete strengths required based on international residential code, which is shown on the top, and versus uh, the ACI 318, which is the structural code that, that we use. And um, you can see you tend to, you don't necessarily need a lot of strength to meet code, 2,500 PSI for spread footings and walls. What's important here is what happens when we get, as far as durability is concerned, what happens when we get outside of the ground, um, walls or slabs that are exposed to freeze thaw. Um, and there we want to see higher strength. And the reason for that is like what I had in the previous slide, right? Uh, you, the code is trying to demand that you use higher strength so that you can have um, lower permeability in that concrete. I also wanted to show here too, that we like to communicate this to our ready-mix supplier in this way so he knows each element in our building, um, what air content we need, what fly ash or slag we want, or, or at least what range. We leave it up to them to figure out the details, but we give them a range that we want. And uh, a lot of our jobs too, we'll, we'll even tell them what's the maximum cement that we want to allow in a mix um, for our sustainability goals. We also try to use the largest aggregate that we can, which um, is often an inch and a half for a lot of these elements. You have to be careful with this if you're pumping concrete or if you have rebar close to the wall. A lot of residential walls have rebar right down the middle, so you could get away with a larger aggregate, but um, you need to be careful about your aggregate size and your concrete, your cover on your rebar. I have three uh, examples. I called up a local ready mix supplier here. This is uh, Geiger here in Kansas City. And here's an example of a footing mix that he has. And it's, it's pretty low cement. Um, and they, this is used all over the city, 288 pounds of cement. Um, and in this case, they're using three quarter inch aggregate because it's the one that they have stocked. But um, I would recommend that you guys like maybe screenshot this and talk to your local ready mix supplier. Um, not, you know, not only do you want um, to minimize cement just, just, just for um, carbon reasons, but having more slag and fly ash in your mix can be a more durable, more better performing concrete in the end. Here's an example of a wall mix, and I've got one for an exterior slab as well. I'm, I'm happy to share these slides with others afterwards if, uh, if anyone's interested. And uh, Bruce mentioned Marin County. If you go and look on their website, they've actually um, set limits on the amount of CO2 or the amount of cement allowed in any one of their, their mix. This is a good place to go to, to see what a reasonable mix might be.
as far as submitted content. This is a repeat slide. Sorry about that. I also was curious um, how much cement or CO2 is in a typical foundation. So I threw this into Revit. This is a standard eight foot basement wall with slab and um, spread footing uh, per IRC. And here's a grand total of all the, the volume of concrete and what that relates to in terms of total cement, which is amazing. This little foundation has 2.6 thousand pounds, 2,600 pounds of cement in it. And it's the equivalent to 1.3 tons of CO2 in this guy. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, that was just in the footings. Total, 10.3 uh, tons of CO2. For those who do, um, you know, just a, a thickened footing, um, you can see this, this foundation, same size, is four and a half tons of CO2. So basements are pretty CO2 intensive. We do a lot of basements in Kansas City, but if you're not doing a basement, you're probably better off on the cement and CO2 story. Coming to the end of my slide, I wanted to show a couple alternatives. Um, I've never done one of these wood foundations, but I know they have been done. Uh, I think you guys have talked about these recently. Um, I'm still kind of amazed that, that people do this. <laughs> um, but it is an option, and it's definitely a low CO2, low carbon option. Other options are precast walls. I, I like this. Um, I don't know if others have had good luck with these walls. I've not had one of these on a project yet, but um, there's a lot of risk in the foundation for a contractor. It, for rain, uh, delays, and if you could have a, your basement walls as precast and install them quickly, I could see there being a lot of uh, constructability um, budget region, reasons to do this. It's also fairly low CO2. And then I know um, a lot of people have talked about doing free, free floors. I wouldn't recommend this in the basement. Um, you know, the bottom of the basement wall is braced by that concrete slab. So I don't, I don't see your load path, how that works very well without some detailed design. Um, but for a turn down slab, this, uh, this could make a lot of sense for you. And that's all I had, guys. So thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Trevor. Um, let's go right into Christie's presentation. Unless there's any well, any any quick questions, we're no, let's let's go right into Christie's presentation. Sounds great. So while I'm getting this uh, set up, I thought I'd address some of the most important questions that I saw in the chat thread. Uh, no, you cannot socially distance curling. There is, however, a virtual curling tournament that's being set up and it's being dominated by teenage boys right now, but it looks really interesting if you're into that sort of thing. Um, also, I love the shout out to Coulter Wall from Saskatchewan. I had no idea that he was famous anywhere outside of our province. So that's cool for those of you who are into Coulter Wall country music, Saskatchewan prodigy. So getting into uh, my presentation here, uh, in terms of tying this all together, the reason why we talk about concrete in terms of carbon emissions is because uh, concrete is the most abundant man-made material in the world, and as a result of that, cement production creates 7% of the world's CO2 greenhouse gas emissions. It is the largest contributor to embodied carbon in the built environment. So if cement was, a, it would be the third largest emitter of CO2, believe it or not. And the reason why cement creates so much CO2, as Trevor alluded to earlier, is because of the way it made. Uh, basically, how cement is manufactured is it's done by taking limestone, calcium carbonate, that is mined from a quarry, and heated to about 2600 degrees Fahrenheit. At this temperature, the calcium carbonate molecule itself splits in half. One half is CO2, that goes into the atmosphere as a waste byproduct. Uh, the other half is calcium oxide. So this is the free lime, the critical binding material used in cement. And because of this process between what's called the calcination reaction, where the calcium carbonate splits in half, and then also the amount of heat and energy that's required to make this reaction happen, according to the EPD for US Portland cement, every ton of cement results 1.04 tons of CO2. So it's a pretty carbon intensive process as it exists right now. 
But the interesting thing is that uh, the kryptonite of the cement industry is also possibly the, uh, the superpower of the concrete industry, which is that concrete has the ability to mineralize CO2. And it all comes from, because of this early on calcination reaction where the calcium carbonate molecule splits in half, it turns out that we can use the CO2, CO2 that's um, captured from industrial emitters, to inject back into concrete and put it back together. So what happens is when you introduce CO2 with concrete, whether it's fresh concrete, hardened concrete, you can see a chemical reaction occur where CO2 and calcium oxide together reforms back into its original state, which is calcium carbonate, CaCO3. So it's this reverse calcination reaction that is um, that represents a potential for concrete to actually be one of the main contributors to the solution of carbon emissions. And so this is where carbon cures come into play is uh, we are one of the technology innovators out there that is utilizing CO2 as a beneficial ingredient in concrete manufacturing. So our technology beneficially repurposes carbon dioxide to reduce the carbon footprint of concrete without compromising concrete's performance. And we are more than just a conceptual, you know, cool thought in a lab experiment kind of thing. Um, our concrete uh, has been delivered to construction sites across North America and now into Singapore as well. Um, for the past number of years, we have over 200 concrete plants that are operational. Uh, over 5 million cubic yards of concrete have been made with our technology through our partners. Uh, so we're really excited about this and we've been able to achieve significant carbon savings to date. So going into how the process works, starting with the CO2 supply, uh, CO2 is collected from large emitters. So we don't collect the CO2. This is done by industrial gas suppliers. Um, names are Praxair, Airgas, Lindy. These industrial gas suppliers have their technologies that capture CO2 from mainly fertilizer plants and ethanol plants. And it's a huge industry, this capture and purification of CO2. It gets distributed and sold to the market. Um, and I'm curious in, you know, answering the chat thread or anyone else on the panel here, anyone want to guess why the capture and distribution of CO2 is such a huge industry? Hold up your can of beer if you might figure it out. It's carbonated beverages. So now a good beer is going to have natural carbonation, but some of the cheap beers will also use carbonation that comes from external sources. But soda, any kind of carbonated beverage is typically made from CO2 that is captured from an industrial emitter. So it means there's this huge industry already that is capturing, purifying the CO2, but it's not having a positive environmental benefit because the CO2 stays a gas. You know, we open up the can, it, there's a fizz, that's CO2 going back up to the atmosphere. And, uh, and so eventually that CO2 makes its way back to the atmosphere. But what we're doing is we're utilizing that CO2. When we inject it into concrete, we actually mineralize it and get rid of it forever. So going back to the supply in terms of how it works, a CO2 supplier will install a tank at any concrete plant where carbon cures technology is installed. And in this tank, it's pressurized so the CO2 is a liquid. Carbon Cure then delivers a precise dosage of this liquefied CO2 into concrete as it's being mixed. So this is all integrated with the batching software in a normal concrete plant. It's an automated process and it's all fitting into normal batching procedures. So it's just like, you know, for those of you who are familiar with how concrete is manufactured, it's just like any other kind of admixture. We're injecting a precise dosage of the CO2. But then what happens when the CO2 is injected into the fresh concrete, a chemical reaction occurs where the CO2 finds those calcium oxide molecules that came from the cement. And in the presence of a fresh wet concrete mix, it's like a magnetic attraction that occurs between the CO2 and the calcium oxide. And these two materials attract each other and uh, form back into their original state, which was calcium carbonate. And so what we're doing is creating nano-sized calcium carbonate particles inside of this concrete mix. And it's the size of the particle that's really critical. Because it's so tiny, these nanoparticles bind to the outside of the remaining cement and make that cement more efficient. That results in higher strength. Higher strength allows for the ability to use less cement. 
And ultimately, that's what we're all about. So if we do nothing else, just add a precise dose of CO2, you get about a 10% improvement to compressive strength at 28 days. And that allows for an adjustment in cement content. So looking on the right side of the graph, what we're looking at here is the bread and butter of what we do. The light orange bar shows the CO2, or sorry, shows, this, um, shows the concrete mix, the control mix, hitting about 4,000 PSI at 28 days. The, the next bar shows that same mix with a 5% cement reduction. So as you'd expect, drop in strength. But then the next bar shows the same mix with 5% uh, cement reduction plus CO2. CO2 brought the strength back up to where it was before. So it's an example of an optimized mix where the concrete team said, how, can, how much cement can we take out of this mix while maintaining the same strength by using CO2? And ultimately this process has a neutral impact on all the other fresh and hardened properties of concrete. So set time, workability, pumping, air content, temperature finishing, freeze thaw pH, density, durability, color texture. We could go into this for a long time, but I was only given eight minutes, so I should probably just move on. So how much CO2 can be saved? Well, it works out to about 25 pounds of CO2 reduced per cubic yard um, as a rough rule of thumb. And that can really depend on the optimization of the mix. Where we really get the most carbon savings from is being able to reduce cement content. But this can really add up on a project by project basis. So here's an example of 725 ponds, a 360,000 square foot office in Atlanta, Georgia. 48,000 uh, cubic yards of concrete were made through our partner Thomas Concrete. With the use of carbon cure, they're able to save 1.5 million pounds of CO2, which is equivalent to 800 acres of forest absorbing CO2 for a year. Another way to look at it, the, this building sits on about an acre of space. So if that building wasn't there, and instead of where an acre of trees, those trees would continue to absorb CO2 for the next 800 years. So that's pretty cool when you can think about what your building projects are capable of doing. And we have lots of examples of this across the coast, uh, across the, the country. So everywhere from LinkedIn campus in San Francisco, uh, I've got Tech Campus in Indianapolis, uh, McDonald's in Chicago, which is super fun, obviously, because it's McDonald's, uh, an airport in Calgary, um, and even the uh, Department of Transportation. So Chicago and Honolulu, or Hawaii Departments of Transportation have been utilizing carbon cure in their paving applications as well. And what is the biggest barrier that we face as an innovative solution to reducing carbon um, has to do with structural engineering specs. So if you are a structural engineer, you know, on the uh, call today, or if you work with structural engineers, I'd really encourage you to look at your specs to see if you might have uh, limitations that inadvertently limit us from being able to apply innovative strategies. So particularly minimum cement content, maximum supplementary cementitious content, maximum water cement ratio where it's not applicable. Uh, there are a lot of guidelines that have been issued by ACI and the NRMCA that help move towards a performance-based spec so that you can uh, still get the performance that you're looking for out of concrete without creating these unnecessary barriers. And ultimately, this is the last, uh, you know, my final message, which is how can you help to reduce concrete's carbon impact? Well, Bruce mentioned it earlier, communicate. I really can't stress this enough. It's amazing how much communication seems to be the, the biggest barrier of all is communicate your commitment to embody carbon throughout the supply chain early and often. Design for what you need use supplementary cementitious materials, consider innovative low carbon cement, consider recycled innovative high quality aggregates, remove the unnecessary performance-based concrete specs, consider performance concrete specs, and of course, specify or approve carbon mineralized concrete, which is what we're up to. So let's open it up for questions. Hopefully about curling or beer. Hey, quick question for you, Christy. Um, is this being used in residential construction very often or, or do you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's, I don't have the exact yeah. number off the top of my head, but I'd probably guess almost 80 to 90% of the usage is uh, residential. Um, and so that has to do with the performance based type of specifications that residential tends to have. And so most often when we, partner with a concrete producer, they'll start using it in a residential right away, and then we work to get approval in the commercial specifications. Christy, we've got a, we've got a number of questions uh, for you. So I, I think we'll start right there. Um, since you just finished, uh, the first question 
was just simply about how um, using carbon cure affects the cost of concrete. And I assume that would be, you know, the cost to the, to the builder. Yeah, it's a good question. So we partner with concrete producers and then the concrete producer in turn will supply it to the market. So I can't answer for certain, ultimately because it's up to the concrete producer to set the price. But in the overwhelming majority of applications, it has been cost neutral or minimally impacted. Um, and it just has to do with the stage at which the concrete producer is in terms of um, being able to use the technology on a regular basis and whether they're able to reduce the amount of cement that they feel comfortable with. So I was curious how much energy it takes um, to actually liquefy the CO2. Well, it's not a significant amount of energy because it's the CO2 is put into this pressurized tank and under pressure, CO2 exists as a liquid. So it goes back to that ideal gas equation of PV equals NRT. Really just need to get it in the pressurized environment and it will become a liquid. And, and as, an, as an admixture, how much, um, how much can be added to safely to, uh, to a concrete mix? Well, we uh, deliver a precise dosage of CO2 that is determined based off the optimal performance of the concrete. So this can vary in different concrete mixes and different applications. It's typically about 0.2% by weight of cement is the optimal dosage. And um, we found that by in introducing the optimal amount of CO2, we're able to get the best performance, which means the best strength. And that's how we're able to obtain the maximum cement reductions, which is where we get most of the carbon savings from. Cool. And one, one more directly for you that just, just popped up is, um, are any of the, anyone in the precast concrete market using carbon care at this point? We, we do have uh, a partner in, with Rock Solid in um, Texas who is uh, using uh, carbon care, their precaster. We're also uh, partnered with a number of uh, concrete masonry producers uh, uh, across the country. So notably uh, Amco in Washington, D.C. area and Jandris in um, uh, in Boston were some of our really early uh, adopters of carbon cure who helped uh, validate the, the technology in an early stage. Cool. And, and I guess this question could be for anyone. Um, so and this, it came in a while ago, so I'm not exactly sure how it was phrased, but um, uh, one of the attendees was just curious if anyone has looked at um, the sort of the overall um, impact of precast versus poured in place concrete and if it's if it's any better from a from a carbon perspective, or even just minimizing, um, minimizing concrete or Portland cement. Um, I used to do structural engineering design for a precaster, a handful of precasters in the Kansas City area. Um, at the time, I wasn't really tuned into that um, sort of the environmental impact. But what I do recall was that. Um, they often had to use a higher strength concrete, a lot of cement, because they have to strip the concrete, the, the precast out of form early. So they need a high early strength. And they get that from the cement. The cement hardens up faster than um, fly ash or slag. So they, they tended to be pretty high cement, um, so pretty high carbon mixes. But they also tend to be designed very efficiently too. Um, so there might be less overall volume of concrete uh, they might have a sandwich panel, for for example. Um, so I don't know how that balances out on net, uh, but the but the material itself would be pretty high CO two, generally. I think this is Trevor. You were you were speaking about this, but um, I think this is potentially a question for anyone, um, including including maybe um, some of the the hosts. But uh, you talked about permeability, and you, I think if I understood right, you talked about how you know as to strengthen to strengthen a concrete mix, we take the permeability out of it. And there are a couple of uh, questions about how that affects the concrete used in a building from a building science perspective. And you know, it, I, I um, it did make me think immediately about just about you know um, how much moisture can move through concrete, its wicking ability, and if there were, if that was an additional benefit of taking out the perme permeability of it. Yeah, that's a question I don't really know much about. I mean, um, even a highly or a very low permeable concrete is still going to wick water. Um, mm -hmm. Is it going to transfer vapor? Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay. I, I have a, a quest question for 
for for Bruce, I believe I believe I've 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 read or heard you talk about. Is it um, are there alternative concrete mixes? Is there a is it B three? Is is there is there like a clay admixture you add or or something like that? Um, what are some what are some other ways we can? I mean, I I think Christie's car carving cure concept is great, but what what are some other things people can do that that also reduce the the, the uh, cement content? Well, like I said, there's a number of different pathways to get to a lower carbon footprint. And generally, um, it involves using less cement and replacing it with calcined clay, slightly burned clay, or ground limestone, or injecting carbon as with carbon cure, or with using carbon, a carbon aggregate, artificial carbon aggregate, not gravel that you dug out of some riverbed somewhere, but that you made out of emissions. All of these are different stages of technology. Uh, um, there's stuff coming. I believe that in another generation, we'll be making concrete by just, you drive up to the site with a backhoe and a barrel of, of designed enzymatic fluid that you mix with the site soil and it hardens the concrete and there's your foundation. Um, and the beginnings of that are already with us. Biomason, um, invented by this wonderful woman, Ginger Dozier, down in uh, North Carolina. Um, they're making bricks out of enzymes. And um, she's, got, she's starting to work with the Department of Defense and doing all sorts of interesting stuff. She can't do it on site yet. But I said, how long does it take you to get to like 3,000 PSI? She says, oh, a couple days. I said, a couple days? That's the first of what will surely be many versions of biological concrete. There's many others in labs everywhere. You see interesting, enticing reports, but we're going to, um, as soon as possible, we're going to get away from basically from baking rocks in order to make our buildings because we just, it's stupid, especially in, in it's, it's part of creating the tsunami of climate change. It's hitting us now. So uh, that's the long range plan for you right now. We were trying to give you tips of things you can do right now. Carbon cure is something you can do right now. You can use fly ash or slag right now if you can get them. You can um, use blended cements are available most places right now. A lot of the hangup is not technological, it's cultural. Because wherever you might be, there's a different attitude. In the Bay Area, we could write a low carbon concrete code because it's kind of what everybody's doing already. And we already also had a lot of knowledge about we, we'd measured the concretes we were making. And so we knew what the carbon footprint of 30 different mixes at 3000 PSI were. So we could come up with some numbers with some very careful you know, statistical work to get the numbers that we put in Marin County code, which will not be the same if you tried to do a code wherever you are, you who are listening. It was tailored to Northern California. It'll be different numbers anywhere else. Um, so yeah. I, I hope I think we've covered all the things you can do now, but there's some really yeah. cool stuff coming, and we're in a we're in a stone age basically of concrete. It's going to go into <laughs> some really wild, cool stuff. But basically, I think we're going to grow it, and it's not going to involve burning fossil fuels. A, a a sort of related. It's it's a little bit of a of a of a tangent, but a, a related sustainability issue. I've, I've heard from such several sources that there's a worldwide shortage of sand for concrete. I mean, there are a lot of, there, there's a lot of sand where I am, but is that true? Is it something to be concerned with? Is that just a distraction? What's, what's the story with the sand shortage? I think what you, oh, it's true. well, okay, go ahead. For some years now in parts of India, there are sand mafias and they'll come and hurt you. If, if you've got sand and you don't want to let them buy it or dig it up, they'll come and hurt you. And, take your sand and your gravel because they're, they're building so much. Um, I talked to Don Davies who cut a big engineering firm in Seattle does work all over the world. He said, we're pouring 10,000 yards of concrete every day in India right now on one project or another. It dwarfs China pours more concrete in four years than we poured in the 20th century in North America. So when you hear that we're building another New York city every month on the earth right now, it, it you might, be incredulous because if you're in North America, you don't see that happening, even if there's a building boom going on. Because it's not, it's happening in China and India. Um, but they're using huge amounts and they're running out of sand and gravel, yes. So 
the promise of something like Blue Planet's artificial aggregate is more than just storing the carbon. It's sparing the riverbeds and the seashores where we're digging this stuff up now. We all live near trashed riverbeds that we dug up to get the gravel for the concrete for the cities that we're near. Yeah, what I was going to say about that is um, it's the pea gravel. Uh, pea gravel is great in concrete um, that they get out of riverbeds. It's smooth. Uh, it requires less paste around it to uh, be flowable and to be able to pump it. As we're running out of that, we have to crush aggregate. And that's more um, jagged. It requires more paste, and you get the paste from you know cement and water. Uh, so it becomes more more cement, more CO two. I think just to add to a couple things, if we're going to talk about um, you know how do we innovate within concrete and how do we get those innovations to have meaningful impact, we also have to talk about scale and the the ability for different kinds of innovations to be able to scale at a global level and part of that scale involves um, economic feasibility so that's one of the big challenges that's being faced by you know a lot of the innovations and solutions that are out there is finding ways to achieve scale um, achieve an economic feasibility and and really work within the way that uh, concrete operations and concrete codes and standards exist now so that we can start to make meaningful impact now um, as we know with uh, through architecture 2030, we need, we have basically the next decade to achieve about a 65% reduction in embodied carbon if we wanna meet the impact um, goals of the Paris Agreement. And so we need things that can work now and can work to scale really fast. Uh, question directed at Bruce uh, from CODA um, is, why do you think the uh, Pantheon lasted 2,000 years, but our concrete won't? Yeah, hi, Coda. Long time. Um, and Coda goes on to say that, uh, it reference a, a, a temple in Hawaii that was uh, built to last for 1,000 years. The guy who designed that temple was the guy who told me the Pantheon wouldn't last if built by a modern engineering firm. This wonderful... Uh, elderly Indian engineer, uh, P.K. Mehta. I'm not even sure if he's still alive. He's certainly retired from the University of California, but he is like the, the man in concrete. Uh, he wrote all sorts of books. He's the guy who taught me about fly ash and pozzolans in concrete. Pozzolans. Somebody asked about pozzolans. Pozzolans. It's a supplementary, supplemental to concrete. It, it, um, the original pozzolan was the uh, volcanic soils that the Russians discovered in Pozzuoli, Italy, um, and thus the name, but it's a, it's a supplemental material. I better leave it at that because it gets complicated and chemical. P.K. Mehta was asked to design this Hindu temple on the island of Kauai that would support these um, carefully hand-carved massive stone, um, basically a Stonehenge, only all the pieces were carved in India and shipped over, and they wanted to last a thousand years, and he's, I said, how do you make it do that? He goes, you don't put any metal in it. Yeah. Period. And so he had to design something not only didn't have any metal in it, but didn't have any um, wouldn't have any cracks. So it had to be extremely low permeability. And that was very low water content and a lot of fly ash. And that's how he did it. And he's the guy who taught me. And so a modern engineering firm, you say, design me a Pantheon and they put a bunch of rebar in it. They, they wouldn't be able to do otherwise because every modern building code would make them, even if they wanted not to. Um, well, there you go. And now that's what I mean. Whoa, what's the deal? We don't need rebar and concrete. Well, no, it serves a purpose. Um, you could do that in Kauai because it's a non-seismic area. It's, very, it's a very calm part of the islands, wait, the more mature part of the Hawaiian islands. But um, in San Francisco, you wouldn't go too far that, with that kind of an idea. But nonetheless, that's the downfall of most concrete is the metal. The minimum coverage that we put on rebar all the time is, is there to protect the metal from corrosion. And reducing permeability yeah. protects the metal better. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And the reason that works is because air comes into the concrete uh, through those little gaps that occur, those little veins that I talked about, and it starts to carbonate the concrete. It actually does absorb carbon from the atmosphere in the process, but it changes the alkalinity um, the pH of that concrete. And once the pH 
drops far enough, it no longer protects the steel and any any metal that's in there starts to corrode. So yeah, um, you can get long durability. If, if you do have to use rebar, you can increase your cover and you can lower your permeability um, to increase your, your, li your life. Have any of, of, of you looked into the um, carbon impact of autoclaved aerated concrete? I actually did Google that the other day uh, just because I was curious why it's not being used anywhere. I, I found that it's there's a manufacturer in, in Florida. Um, that appears to be maybe it. I don't, I don't know enough about the material uh, to really speak to it, but I've been kind of curious about it. Um, maybe someone else can speak more intelligently. I've been, I've been messing with alternative materials for 30 years now, and I keep seeing AAC, autoclave aerated concrete, or even just um, aerated concrete. And I never see it get anywhere. It's, I think they've been using it a bit in Germany for a while, and maybe they still are in maybe other parts of Northern Europe, but it has never taken off here. You can't pour it on site. It has to be bricks or some sort of precast. But the main thing I think is, I don't know if anybody's actually done an else life cycle analysis and measured the footprint, but you make AAC by grinding up aluminum into a powder and you throw the pow powdered aluminum into the concrete and each of those bits of aluminum turns into a bubble gives off a hydrogen gas, I think. Um, aluminum is a super high energy material, so it's got a huge footprint right off the bat. And that's how you get all the little bubbles that make AAC lightweight and insulating. But it's not that strong. You can't reinforce it. Not very easily, anyway. And um, I think there's other reasons why it's just it hasn't taken off in North America, though people have tried. And I've been watching it for 25 or more years now. Christy, we had a, a, a couple of people ask the same question, and you have a colleague answering it in the chat. So, um, so they've they've gotten their answers. But just for people who may not be paying attention to the chat or are just listening tonight, um, I wanted, the question is about the efficiency of the process of injecting the um, CO2 into concrete and, and um, if there's any losses in that process. Yeah, for sure. So I'll give a shout out to my buddy, Diane, who's on the technical side of the company, who's been answering questions in the chat. Um, so when we inject CO2 into concrete, about 90% of it becomes converted into, uh, into that mineral. There's about a 10% loss on ejection. There is also in the process, obviously, a carbon footprint involved with the um, you know, with the purification and distribution and transportation of the CO2. So that's really important to consider. We've done some pretty extensive uh, analysis to figure out, make sure that there's a net impact. And obviously those emissions can vary um, anywhere at the lowest end. It's about 60% um, net versus 80 to 90% net. Um, and ultimately any of the carbon savings that we, we report um, have incorporated that analysis into it to make sure that we're talking about the net benefit at the end of the day. Cool, thank you. And another question that we've had a couple times tonight is about, um, is about using ICFs, um, insulated concrete forms, um, and if that is a, a helpful solution for, I think, I think people have asked if it protects the concrete and allows it to cure better, um, if it reduces, uh, if it helps reduce concrete, and just sort of the, the carbon footprint of that material, um, you know, in combination with, with concrete, if anyone has looked into that. And I believe that material is typically EPS. Most insulating concrete forms are basically giant EPS uh, un masonry units that you then fill with grout and rebar. And uh, it's a very efficient wall system. It's very thermally very effective. It's structurally very strong. Um, what I don't like about them is they're made out of a petrochemical, which is going to be nasty in a fire. Um, Fast wall is made out of wood chips. I'm doing a fast wall project right now here in the Bay Area. Um, and it's been around for a while. I think there's other versions of it here and there. It's wood chips with cement, bound with cement. So it's basically a wood chip block that you then grout, or you can add more insulation in the cavities. They're all okay. Um, they're, um, I don't think they're going to uh, scale up. Uh, Christy was talking about the importance of scaling things, and we got to scale like crazy. They're really good technologies, and I don't think they're going to go anywhere. Um, it, you can mix anything up in a, in a big paste of cement and have a useful building block. 
just about any and people have paper creek and um all sorts of stuff but it's cement it, you know we got to get away from the cement so mm -hmm. I, I have very mixed feelings is the short answer about um insulating concrete forms mm -hmm. the best one i know of actually there's a there's a system of you can build with um cellulose blocks and then put a, a earthen plaster or a cement plaster on either side of it and get a, a sort of a on on-site sip panel because you got a structural skin on both sides and the cellulose insulation in between and it's very effective thermally and seismically and in every other way it's also called straw bale construction there's a, a company here in maine, maine called genes concrete uh they, uh, they make a uh, concrete block that's sort of oversized and it has this really funky web pattern that sort of offset webs and they put um, polystyrene beads in with their concrete and, and they've had it tested at, it, it performs in like the high r20s uh, 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 for the wall and and uh, one thing I like about that is uh, it's basically you're building a wall but it's ha half air so um, do you guys think um, concrete block technology like you know beyond AEC blocks are there other is concrete block technology CMU technology of some sort is that a possible solution or do you think we think we really need to be focusing on 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 poured poured cast in place concrete or tilt ups I think the question to me is where where are we talking about using this system at mm -hmm. um, I mean my my dad built an ICF house uh, because he was worried about tornadoes. It's definitely high strength. It's high carbon relative to a two by six wall construction. So, I mean, as far as the environmental impact, I don't see how it makes a lot of sense above ground, maybe as a basement. Um, it could make sense. I'd have to look at the specifics. I think you have to draw a distinction. Masonry construction has been around for 10,000 years and it's never going to go away because it's easy and everybody understands. That's part of why straw bale construction took off. They're just big fuzzy bricks and everybody gets it, and stacks them up and there you go. Of course it gets more complicated than that. But And so likewise, you can make a block out of just about anything. David Easton uh, is making rammed earth blocks here in the Bay Area, watershed materials, for those of you who want to Google it. Um, and there's all sorts of different versions of the basic block with a hole in the middle so you can grout it or insulate it or not. But um, masonry construction is a great way to build because people know how to do it and they always have and they probably always will. And even in a dense city like the cities of Asia, you'll see teams of masons building masonry walls for buildings that are going to be 30 stories high. So um, it's not a matter of do we want to use if it's a diff just to what do you make the block out of? That's the question. Let's make them out of cool stuff. <laughs> I like it. Emily, um, did you have a question? Um, I didn't exactly have a question, but we've heard uh, hempcrete as a thing. Does anybody know anything about it? Um, my experience thus far on hempcrete is very kind of homeowner do-it-yourself-ish. I don't know what the scale is on, on pushing that into a more commercial market. Um, I just got, I was on a call last week. There's a nascent, just starting hemp building association. There are 400 people on the call all over North America. It's a, it's a growing industry. My client that I'm doing a Dur uh, Faswell project with wanted to do hempcrete, but she studied it and talked to the people and said, they're not there yet. The supply chain isn't steady yet. The, the installers aren't reliable yet. It's kind of like where straw bale construction was 25 years ago. Kind of a, sketchy sort of a thing but as a material it's fantastic um, to make hempcrete you take the part of the plant that nobody else wants after everybody else has gotten the oils and food and clothing fibers and all of that what's left is the herd which is this really cool great fiber that you can mix with lime or cement or just about anything and make blocks or pack it into place it's a, got a huge future i think hempcrete is um and it's very scalable. It's urban. You can do skinny walls and it'll insulate and it won't burn and bugs won't eat it and all of that. So it's got a huge future, but it's just getting going as an industry here in North America. We, we are coming right up on our 
time, how about, um, do you guys want to give any last, last thoughts? What do you think our audience should go away thinking about for a concrete? Any, uh, any, 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 any words of wisdom? I'll give uh, my word of wisdom, which is that, um, you know, what we see is, is that everybody who's involved in the design and building process in some way, whether you're an owner, architect, contractor, engineer, product manufacturer can influence this process. And so just to be top of mind for it to matter to you, um, to pay attention and simply to ask questions about what is your embodied carbon impact and what can you do to reduce it um, is really going to go a long way. Like it really is the first step. We're only just starting to understand it and we need to act really quickly to achieve some serious, um, uh, some serious uh, savings at the end of the day. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go second, I guess. I'll just say that um, there's a lot you can do just by asking and, um, you know, talking to your ready mix supplier, talk to other builders. Um, if you know a structural engineer in your neighborhood, call and ask them, read Bruce's book. I mean, uh, we throw away so much cement and we, um, we pour so much concrete that's much higher strength than we need much more cement than we actually need and we're not necessarily getting a better product for it higher strength doesn't necessarily mean better concrete so um i think we could be a lot smarter than that and i think we can in in the end save a whole lot of co2 as a result excellent challenge everybody's assumptions including your own communicate do everything you can and be somebody your grandchildren will be proud of when they look back at this time that is perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, to our guests for sharing your time and expertise with everybody. Thank you to the audience for uh, st staying with us. It was uh, great attendance tonight, and I'm sure lots of people will be uh, watching this in the future. And thank you to my co-hosts. Um, I hope everybody has a great night. Thank awesome. you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, thanks for joining us.